This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. So let's go through and have a look at IFRS 15, a uh, very commonly examined standard at financial reporting and even more so at strategic business reporting. It's important, isn't it? You know, particularly when it's coming to the performance of the entity, because what we've got there is we're looking at the, or hopefully the largest number that you have on the statement of profit or loss, that revenue figure right at the very top. But don't just think it's looking at the, the revenue figure at the very top, but there's a lot more to it. Uh, we've got the revenue coming from the sale of goods and services. So how do we recognize the revenue for those different types of transactions within our financial statements? Uh, do we get revenue coming in with regards to interest income? So, you know, that's all looking at one side of the argument in terms of our statement of profit or loss and our performance statement. But what about the, the statement of financial position? What, what are we going to recognise there with regards to revenue? I suppose one that would jump out at you will be your receivables balance. But there might be some accrued income, there might be some deferred income. So there's a huge amount that's going on within this standard. Don't just think that it is in relation to that one line item in profit or loss being your revenue okay so even though there's a lot going on uh what i like about it is that there is a set not methodology but there's a set process that we can follow based upon the rules that we have within the standard okay so there's five areas in which we go through and we look at each one on a step-by-step -step basis so first of all, you need to identify the contract. So there's a sale between one company and the other. Uh, is there a contract between the two? Now, it doesn't have to be a legally written contract. It could be implied or it could be agreed verbally. But there needs to be some form of agreement between the two. Once we've identified the contract, that brings in IFRS 15. And then we need to look at the, the obligations that are there within the contract. Uh, it could be very simplistic and that there is just one obligation uh, to construct an asset on behalf of our customer. So building the head offices or it could be that there are several different obligations within it. So if you're looking at computer businesses, maybe they are providing installation. Uh, maybe they are providing support and maintenance. So we might need to split out those obligations in order to recognize the revenue. Once we've split out those obligations, we then need to look at the overall price that we're actually going to split out. OK, so most of the time it will be quite easy to spot. But in reality, there could be complexities about what the value of that revenue is. Uh, the value of that revenue might be conditional on various scenarios being met. Uh, what happens if there is interest within that transaction price? How do we deal with that so if we're discounting things back to present value and there's an interest element to it how do we determine that transaction price so again we need to look at the rules there once we've got that transaction price in step three and we know the obligations in step two how do we take what we've worked out in step three and split it between the obligations in step two so we're going to allocate them to each performance obligation and then once we know the obligations have their price allocated, we can then begin to recognize the revenue as we satisfy the criteria within the obligation. Because sometimes we might need to recognize the revenue at a point in time, so immediately, or we might need to spread that revenue recognition over a period of time. OK, so that's the background. We have a lot more rules. The old standard ISA team was very subjective. Uh, left a lot to the imagination. So that therefore led to some accounting scandals. Entities were recognising revenue too early when they shouldn't be. But their justification was, well, we're just following judgments and what the guidance is given within the standard. Well, now we have some rules, uh, a five step process. Uh, if we can follow the five step process, we shouldn't go too far wrong in any exam question. And more importantly, within the real world. So you've got the contract, the obligations, the price, we allocate and then we recognize. So the contract, the obligations, the price, allocate, 
recognize. Okay, there we go. So if we go through there and just look at it in a little bit more detail, uh, the first bit is going through there and identifying the contract. I don't think you're going to see much of this in financial reporting, uh, but there doesn't just have to be a, a written contract. Uh, a written contract will be committed. It will have the details of the performance obligations. So in more complex transactions, there will be a written contract. But if you're just looking at a normal credit sale, you know, the, is there a, a written contract with regards to that credit sale? Not really. Okay. Yeah. So there is a verbal or an implied contract between the two parties. Okay. Key bit. Is if you're thinking about recognition, you're thinking about income, uh, we need to make sure that it's probable and measure it reliably. So the measure reliably aspect, I suppose, is coming in step three by looking at the, the transaction price. Uh, the probability, I suppose, is within the contract. Yeah, Does the contract, written, verbal, implied, actually give rise to the fact that we expect that it will probably be settled? Okay. It's more likely than not that it will be settled with, isn't it? Okay. So we've identified the contract. Uh, we then need to look at the performance obligations. So we normally have simple performance obligations. If you go to a supermarket and buy some goods, so you buy yourself some chocolates. Okay. I'll walk up to the shops a little bit later and buy myself some chocolates. Uh, so the supermarket that I am buying the goods from enters into a contract with me. OK, yeah, it's an implied contract as I take the sweets to the counter and then they charge them for me. It's probable. It's certain that I will pay them. So there's, there's only one performance obligation within that contract. Give me the sweets. OK, are they going to oblige under that contract? Yes, they are. OK, because if not. I'm going to create trouble in the shop. It's like, oh, excuse me, where's my sweets? Okay. But on a more serious nature, uh, businesses will sell goods and they will sell services. Uh, a computer business might sell you a computer, but it might also go through there and sell you the installation. Uh, they might go through there and provide you as well with a support package as well. Okay. That's commonly happened in the world of technology, isn't it? You buy the product, so your television. But within the price is also some form of free support uh, in case you, you can't use that product. OK, and they will help you out with it. So what we're going to go through and do is we're going to separate those out. Yeah, we will be able to separate those out if they could be sold separately. Yeah, if they are separately identifiable. So the sale of the computer could be split out from the support because the support could be offered to anybody who's bought a computer from anywhere else okay so therefore you could have a separate price for the television a separate price for the support but you pay a combined price and usually that combined price is cheaper so we'll need to look about how we separate it out but before we get there it's important to, to look at the illustration and make sure that we are happy and understanding what is happening with these performance obligations so here We've got a computer business that primarily sells computer hardware, uh, as well as selling the computers. It also supplies and installs the software. Because, you know, it can be quite complicated turning your computer on and setting it up ready to go. And they also provide technical support. Things go wrong with computers. Updates happen. You don't understand what's happening. Your computer crashes. You need somebody to, to recover all your documents. So you've got that technical support in place. Key bit is that the computer sale, the supply and the installation of the software uh, takes place immediately, doesn't it? And the support takes place over a number of years. So what happens here is that the business live attack sells it as a combined package. So the supply and the installation of the software and then the support package as well. It's a combined contract. However, they could and do go through and sell them separately. So therefore, even though there is one contract, there are two performance obligations. Why? Because each of those obligations can be identified and sold separately. 
I could supply and install the software and not offer the support. The customer could get the supply and the installation of the software elsewhere and then come to me for the technical support. So there's one contract and two separate performance obligations. Okay. There we go. So, so far, where are we? Uh, we've gone through there and done steps one and steps two. Uh, step one is the contract. Uh, step two is the obligation. I think it's probably now worthwhile to just have a quick read through your study text of what we've done so far before you then rejoin us in the next session. And we go through there and look at the transaction price.